From your public media studios, it's the State of Pennsylvania, presenting the issues that affect you, your family, and your region. This is State of Pennsylvania. Oh my goodness. Wow, Pat. Wow. My goodness. Yeah, this, this, is, this is live TV. What did we get ourselves into here? <laughs> well, folks, these last couple of months, we've been introducing you uh, to new Northeast Pennsylvania college and university presidents. This is an unusual time in higher education here in this region as several long-established, highly regarded presidents are stepping down. They're finding successors prepared to lead what's ahead is a challenge worthy of the best university boards of trustees. And from what everyone's saying to us about the man you're about to meet, Wilkes University did a great job. Mm. I think this audience has made that pretty clear tonight. Uh, Pat Leahy is sixth president of Wilkes University, most recently executive VP at the University of Scranton. And before that, here's something interesting for you, an investment officer and account executive in private industry. And as you'll now learn, he knows a lot about fundraising, too. And that's pretty important, isn't it, Pat? It is indeed. May I call you Pat? You may. You may. Everybody does. So. <laughs> <laughs> fundraising. Yeah. It seems more and more that as we move forward in so many not-for-profit organizations, and at the end of the day, so too is higher education, you need to know how to raise money. You do indeed. And uh, fortunately, it's something that I've grown to, to really enjoy. Um, I think that for all nonprofits, we're, we're actually lucky in a way that we have philanthropy as one of the ways that we can generate resources for our good work. Obviously, businesses don't have that, that luxury, but we're going to need to rely on it increasingly in the years ahead, I'm afraid. I, I have your inaugural address, and I'm going to have a lot of fun quoting it tonight. It was wonderful. Thank you. And, and you, have, you have some great stories to tell, and I'm not going to go at it in any particular order. Okay. Let's be disjointed. Sure. Let's misbehave. <laughs> I know the audience, I know the audience is ready. So t let's talk a little bit more about fundraising. You come from the University of Scranton. How many years? Uh, eight years I was there. Okay. So I joined this community in 2004. From where? I was living in central New York State at the time, Ithaca, New York. Sure. And Cornell. Exactly. I had done my uh, graduate work at Cornell. And uh, we left the area, and then my wife and I so enjoyed Ithaca, New York, that we moved back to the area to work in some of those business pursuits that you mentioned. Cayuga Lake. Yes. Beautiful, beautiful place. Beautiful. So you gave Ithaca up. Ithaca is gorgeous. Yes, it is. Yeah. You, came, you came back. <laughs> um, to, you came to northeast Pennsylvania from Ithaca. You go to the University of Scranton. What did they have to offer you? that made you want to make that break? Well, actually, I knew well the president of uh, the University of Scranton, the former president, Scott Pilars, who's now the president of Marquette University. And uh, he recruited me. I think he knew that I always wanted to work in higher education. Mm. And even though I did some different things, uh, he always knew I wanted to. He called me, and he suggested that I come see him, that there might be opportunities uh, for someone like me at the University of Scranton. I had never set foot in northeastern Pennsylvania before, uh, and he just painted a picture of the importance of higher education, the opportunities that would be uh, ahead of me were I to join his team, and uh, told me that northeastern Pennsylvania was a great place to raise a family, which uh, at the time I had two kids. Now I have four, uh, but at the time I had two. And uh, it proved to be an incredibly rich experience in my life, the eight years I spent. I spent with Father Pilars and uh, the others at the University of Scranton. Was it tough to give it up? Uh, it was because I have great friends there still, and uh, I respect the institution in a huge way. Um, but uh, so it was in that regard, but it was not difficult for me to take on the challenge of leading Wilkes University. I mean, I have said repeatedly. Uh, for an individual to be able to move up in his career in higher education and to do that without leaving the area that I've grown to love True. is a really unique privilege for someone in higher education and it's uh, a privilege that I'm extremely grateful for. So how did Wilkes find you? 
to be honest, uh, Bill, I applied for the job. Um, and they tell you, whatever you do, if you're interested in a college presidency, don't, don't apply. apply. <laughs> Let someone else suggest you. Um, and I just decided, you know, I'm going to submit my materials, and if they see in my background, which is, as you mentioned, a little bit of a unique yeah, background, sure is. if they see in that something that resonates with them, I'd like to get into the mix. Uh, so they invited me for one interview, and then a second interview, and then a third interview. Uh, it was a very open, uh, I, I'd like to think, rigorous process. Yeah. Uh, and it, it worked is, out. Isn't it? It is because uh, it's important that all the different constituencies at a university get to know uh, their new president and have a chance, I think, to genuinely weigh in as to who they think uh, would be the best person to lead the institution. So I think they're long, arduous processes, but I think in the end they're, they're very effective. Yeah. I've, I was sharing with you before we started tonight that I've had the opportunity to serve on a college board of trustees, university. Board of Trustees, and I've gone through those sort of searches as a trustee, and, and they are laborious, and they must, in fact, involve all the constituencies. That's right. And arriving at consensus can sometimes be a pretty exhaustive process. Yeah, I've always said that I, I'm totally committed to collaboration, but that does not always end up in consensus. Yeah. Um, so that, that's the way we've, we've tried to approach it so far at Wilkes. And I think it's really important uh, that, that, as I mentioned, all those constituencies have a chance to weigh in. Um, you know, in a nonprofit environment, uh, I think you motivate employees, you motivate people uh, through mission. And True. the more involved they feel in that mission, um, the more effective that organization is going to be. So uh, I think as I mentioned to you before the show, it's not just a best practice in, in higher ed, this idea of shared governance. Mm -hmm. I believe it is an absolute mandate and the most effective universities do it well. We'll, well try you, hard to you, do you it You come way. into higher education from private industry. Private industry doesn't do shared governance. Well, I, I, you're right. I mean, there's uh, much more hierarchical in, in uh, private industry, although I've always said I think it's sort of interesting because as the uh, private industry, businesses and corporations, as they uh, understand the idea of stakeholders and, and buy into the idea of stakeholders, mm -hmm. the multiple stakeholders that any organization has, actually, strangely enough, I think they can learn something from us in higher ed about the importance yeah. of getting um, legitimate input from different constituencies and how that if done properly, can aid the decision-making process. So um, I think generally people think, well, you should learn some, higher ed should learn from business. And I think there are some things that higher ed institutions can learn from businesses. But I think the, the uh, corollary is true increasingly too. That's very interesting. So what's been the biggest surprise? You, you come to Wilkes, inaugurated September 15th. September 15th, that's yeah. right. So, and, and when did you literally start? July 1st. July 1st. Actually, I think it was July 2nd, because I think that was a Monday. Yeah. We must make that clear. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> so what's been your biggest surprise? Your first college presidency. It is. How different is it from what you had done at the University of Scranton? Uh, it's extremely different. Um, I worked, as I mentioned, uh, very, very closely with the president at the University of Scranton. Um, I was first his executive assistant then his vice president of external affairs. So we did a lot of traveling together, uh, doing fundraising and working with government officials. Then as his appointed executive vice president responsible for his strategic priorities. My point being, I worked very closely with him. Sure. But the difference between working very closely with the decision maker and being the decision maker is a world uh, of difference. And, uh, uh, that's been a little bit of a surprise. I figured, you know, I know a little bit about a higher ed, of course. I've worked closely in a lot of different uh, areas of the, of the uh, university. But um, there's nothing like having the, uh, you know, the, the position where you're the final arbiter of, yes. you know, of decisions. So I'm going to ask you to be immodest for a moment. <clears throat> Can you handle that? 
Um, it's too early to say. Uh, uh, I always say it's going very well so far, but things can change quickly. That may be, so, the truth. Uh, that may be true of this interview as well, by the way. Right. Um, what do you think attracted you to the board? You, you know, you figured that out. Are you immodest enough to tell us what it was about Pat <clears throat> Leahy that drew them to you? I think our board saw my uh, mix of experiences as relevant to um, Wilkes today and what we have to deal with and the challenges that higher education, not just Wilkes itself, but higher education in general will face in the future. And I think they saw the mix of experiences, having worked in finance, having worked in sales and marketing, mm -hmm. uh, of course, having worked in higher education at an institution that uh, all of us at Wilkes uh, respect a great deal. Um, and then, you know, having, uh, I have an undergraduate degree in English literature, so that uh, demonstrated my affection for the uh, liberal arts. Oh, uh, it's so clear. But, but my uh, graduate degrees are professional degrees, and, and, and then my doctorate is a, an EDD. So I think, I hope they thought they saw in me a, a, a unique mix of experiences and uh, hopefully the personality that would excel in this kind yeah. of environment. Well, your personality is obviously going to yeah. excel at fundraising, and I'm going to keep coming back to this because it's been my observation over the last, actually, a couple of decades, when college presidents are uh, brought in, <clears throat> successor presidents, much as in business, when new leaders of business are brought in, and this has probably <clears throat> always been true, they're brought up and in from the sales side, right? So higher well, education, often. it seems, almost defaults these days to not the scholar as much as the gregarious outside person who can raise money. Fair? I think fair for some institutions. Um, as you rightly point out, the external affairs demands on the job uh, yeah. today uh, are significant. So um, it's hard to have a college or university president that does not enjoy the external affairs work, fundraising and working with government officials and dealing with prospective parents, um, the, dealing with alumni, the community. So that's such an important part of the job now that I think boards are looking increasingly across the full spectrum of um, duties in higher ed to try to find individuals. It's still important, I believe, though, that uh, that individual uh, have both a great deal of respect for the faculty and can earn respect from mm -hmm. the faculty. So uh, I think it's a unique mix, and, and uh, yeah. it's not always easy to find that. I'm sure I hope that, they did in me, but I'm sure we'll see. I'm sure they did both of those. Um, if you were tuning in, ladies and gentlemen, at the beginning of the show, you heard that we have a rather rowdy audience uh, here in the theater. Uh, they're lively, and we hope they stay lively. In fact, we go looking for things, Pat, that you don't want us to know. <laughs> we, we ask them to tell us things you don't want us to know. Uh -oh. uh, we failed at that. They didn't, they didn't really have much, much to give up. Just as I instructed them. Yes, I'm sure. That. <laughs> we should say also that the people who are about to stand up and make comments um, were not prepped by you, um, but you know them. So I'm going to give you the chance to introduce the gentleman right there who's going to make a comment. Sure. Justin Mattis is a longtime uh, professor at Wilkes University, and he currently serves as the chair of our Faculty Affairs Council. So he is my main liaison to uh, that critically important constituency, the faculty. Sir. Nice to see you. Um, Two-part question, as always, right? Um, first part is, uh, what's the biggest misperception about the relationships just in general between administration and faculty? Um, and the, uh, the second part of the question is, uh, what's the key to maintaining those relationships? What's the greatest misperception, and then what's the key to maintaining that? I think the greatest misperception is that um, I, think peop I think the faculty really does appreciate what the administration tries to do and vice versa. And I think, uh, I I think most people feel, believe that there's always friction between the faculty and administration. And I think uh, that some of that is healthy tension, uh, an organization that wants to grow and improve 
I think there's a little healthy tension there, but I've always discovered uh, quite often that the faculty, you know, believes that the administration is doing what it, it, it thinks is right, and the administration believes that the faculty is doing what it thinks is right. So I think the most important thing is that there be open, transparent, frequent communication between the two parties. And I think the, the problems arise when there's misunderstanding, and I think uh, communicating effectively is the best way to prevent that misunderstanding. Thank you. That was very nicely put. It's a work in progress, this thing called shared governance. It is. Yep. It is. Um, let me, ladies and gentlemen, bear with me for a moment, all those of you at home. Let me cover some biographical points and not dance around them, just put them out there for you so you know this gentleman we're talking to. Uh, Pat Leahy, PhD, EDD, Wilkes University, sixth president. Uh, we've been talking about fundraising a bit. Uh, he says here, as VP of University Relations, led the completion of University of Scranton's, listen to this number, $125 million, that's a big number, Pride, Passion, Promise campaign. You've taught as an adjunct professor. We're going to talk about all of this. But really interesting about Dr. Leahy's background is private industry. He was an investment officer at Allied Capital Corporation right. and an account executive at Deluxe Corporation and a development officer at Georgetown. That's quite a, uh, quite a smorgasbord of titles. That's right. um, we'll talk about the history of Wilkes University too, but I want to talk about Molly. 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 The president's daughter? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Who's watching tonight, I think. I hope so. Molly, it's nice to have you with us. She's 11. She's now 12. See, since this bio came oh, out, that's right. watch them. They snap your fingers, they're 21. Oh, wow. It's terrible. All right, so she's 11. And you quote her in your, in, this inaugural address is a charmer. And I'm going to have fun sharing it with you tonight. But you talk about uh, Molly, who took you aside this summer. And what did she say? She said, uh, Dad, I'd like to be known as the president's daughter. And I said, well, I have two, two daughters and two sons. And I said, um, well, that's fine, Molly, but what about your daughter, Grace, or my, your sister, Grace? And she said, well, that's OK. She can be known as the president's daughter's sister. <laughs> so, um, in fact, I think it's pretty well established around campus. They, they know that she is the president's daughter. So Didn't take long. They welcome it? her at all of our events. Yeah. Now, you're not living on campus, as I remember reading. That's right. No, we're not. Uh, my family lives in Bear Creek Village. It's sort of an interesting story, if I may. We, we actually uh, moved from Dunmore, Pennsylvania, where we were living for the first seven years of my time at Scranton, to Luzerne County and Bear Creek Village before this Wilkes opportunity even came up. And uh, our children uh, go to school down here in Luzerne County, and it got very difficult to cart them back and forth. So we decided if we could find the right community, we'll move closer to their school, and I'll commute back to Scranton. We discovered Bear Creek Village, uh, found a home there, loved the community. And it was only after I moved in there, three or four months after that, I applied for the job at Wilkes. So uh, there's often a mistaken impression ah. that the job at Wilkes brought me to Luzerne yes, County. But no, we committed to Luzerne County even before the Wilkes Isn't job. That, and did yeah. you know that? That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, but you were provided, fate. you could have been provided with a residence on campus. Uh, yes, it's a beautiful uh, president's house uh, uh, on campus. And uh, when we were going through the search process, that came up. And uh, they asked me if I were to get the job, would I move into the president's house? And my wife and I had already talked about it. And for a whole host of reasons, we told them at the time that it's not likely that we would. The principal reason of which, Bill, was uh, at the time we had five and seven-year-old boys. And it's perfectly incompatible <laughs> to entertain and make friends for the university in a home where a five and seven year old boy live. There's so, some delicate things in that yeah, home? Yes. Uh, so we just determined that that wouldn't work. Um, so uh, we just decided we would keep the house. I still have it available, uh, not only to me, but I'm trying to open it up to the entire Wilkes community as an asset for, for all of the community. And uh, my family lives just a 15 minutes away. And okay. you know, I don't think living on campus is necessarily correlated to 
how engaged the president and his family is in the life of the university. Well, your um, students have gotten to know your daughter, evidently. They have, and, uh, and my sons. And Okay. Yeah, so. uh, we, we have an, an interactive audience, ladies and gentlemen, those of you at home. We have a theater practically filled with some students, uh, faculty members, administration from Wilkes University. We also, we also have the phone. That phone number on your screen, 1-800-326-9842. No matter where you are watching tonight, we'd love to have you be part of the show. Meet Dr. Pat Leahy and some of these wonderful folks from Wilkes University. We'll do that right now. We'll go to Bushkill. Wanda is on the phone. Go ahead, Wanda. Hi, good evening. Good, good. evening, Dr. Leahy. Hi, Wanda. Um, I uh, live in Bushkill, Pennsylvania. Um, but I'm very interested in Wilkes University because um, I have taken classes at Wilkes and they've, I've been pretty successful and have enjoyed all of my classes and interactions with my um, fellow students and faculty members. Very supportive campus, I think it is. Um, the reason why I was calling is I'm very interested in what are your thoughts of um, the current initiatives that Wilkes University um, is participating in and trying to diversify the campus, its student body, its administrators, and its staff. Um, because I know Northeastern Pennsylvania is uh, becoming a more diverse area, and Wilkes and the surrounding area, um, uh, which, which you draw a lot of your students from, is a representative of that growth of diversity. Okay, Wanda, thank you so much. What's your answer? Well, uh, first of all, thank you for your interest. I would agree um, wholeheartedly that uh, there are few uh, universities in the country that commit to student success the way uh, Wilkes does. So mm -hmm. I think Wanda's an example of that. Uh, we believe strongly in uh, diversifying our campus. We uh, define the term uh, diversity uh, very broadly. Uh, w w this includes not only uh, ethnic diversity, which we think is important, but we also uh, are trying hard to uh, diversify the student body internationally. We believe that it's an imperative, educational imperative, even though most of our students do come from Pennsylvania, we want to expose as many of our Pennsylvania students to as richly diverse fellow student body as possible, not only ethnically, but internationally as well. Mm -hmm. They're going to graduate into a global environment, let's face it. So we feel it's an educational imperative to ensure that while they're with us at Wilkes, that they're getting exposed to different individuals, different cultures. So it's something we feel very strongly about. I can't wait to come back to you. We'll do it in just a second. Uh, again, referring to your uh, inaugural address, you talk about Wilkes University. I want you to tell the story that in some ways it's a miracle it's even here. Some of the history is such that it overcame what I would characterize by your remarks as huge obstacles. We'll get back. Let's go to the uh, theater. Please introduce yourself. Good evening, Dr. Leahy. My name is Gerard Hetman, uh, Wilkes University, class of 2008. It's great to see you here this evening. Uh, my question is to you, sir, particular with your background in private sector uh, and financial experience, what roles do you see Wilkes University and the other colleges and universities in northeastern Pennsylvania playing in regards to economic development in the future, and particularly with the new science buildings coming online at Wilkes University and the University of Scranton, what role do you see those institutions playing in the new <coughs> Northeastern Pennsylvania bioscience initiative that's been yeah. announced and has been talked about recently? Well, thank you, uh, Gerard, and um, thrilled to have an alumnus uh, here tonight. Um, what he's referring to our new science building, the Larry and Sally Cohen Science uh, Center, which is a $35 million facility, state-of-the-art science facility that will be uh, ready for next academic year. Uh, I always say the two things that, a, the only two things a university president wants to hear about a capital project on time and on budget. <laughs> so we're thrilled that that's going to be available. And we do think that that is going to be uh, a catalyst for economic development uh, in this region. In fact, I think uh, universities are, have an obligation to continue to serve the economic development uh, efforts of their host regions, an obligation to do so. Um, and I always say, too, that uh, it's off, it's, if you ever wor worry that our, uh, our uh, altruism will wane in that regard, it's in our best interest, let's face it, to make sure that we're creating as vibrant a community 
as we can. Focus first, given our location, on downtown Wilkesbury, but hoping that if we can help redevelop the downtown, that will of bode course. well for the entire region. So, thank you for bringing that up. It's uh, something I inherited that science facility, but uh, I'm quite proud of it. All right, back to your inaugural address. Back to your remarkable comment that there are many reasons why Wilkes University shouldn't even be here. Yeah. Started, as you put it, imagine starting, your words, imagine starting an enterprise of any kind, let alone a university, in the midst of the Great Depression. That's right, 1933. Actually, what happened is uh, evidently there was, during that time, uh, a survey of sorts done in the state of Pennsylvania to identify areas where there was a shortage of higher education options. In fact, some, some our uh, campus historian would tell me that he believes that uh, Wilkes-Barre was the largest city in the state of Pennsylvania without a higher education institution. Maybe even the largest city at that time in America without a, a homegrown higher education institution. So what they did is they went to Bucknell University and uh, asked if Bucknell University would be interested in opening up, shall we say, a remote location in Wilkes-Barre. So we started in 1933 as Bucknell University Junior College. Um, and it was only some years later that we became Wilkes College. But uh, the idea that it would start in the Great Depression and then just as we're struggling to get established, World War II, or excuse me, uh, World War II hits and uh, uh, gone are most of the students that we would otherwise um, try to enroll. The, the flip side of that, of course, is the GI Bill saved an institution like Wilkes College and many others across the country when all those GIs returned and uh, pursued a higher education degree. So, uh, By the way, um, you were talking about the, uh, the Cohen, new Cohen building. Uh, the Cohen's son, Rick, is on the board of directors here today. We had a meeting and I talked to Rick, and they're so proud. So excited about uh, what they've been able to do at Wilkes University. But As back to the history, Great Depression, World War II. I've known for many years that Wilkes, in terms of talking about its history, is most proud of its genesis as a uh, first generation school for many, many students. They were the first of their families to, That's right. to go. That's right. In fact, even today, 2000 and now what, 13, <laughs> uh, by some estimates, 50% of our student body are first generation college students, 50%. And that's uh, something we're very proud of, we work very hard at. I, I've often said, Bill, the goal really isn't just first generation college student. The goal is to have first generation college graduates because a lot of first generation students start and don't finish. And we, we, we treat it almost as a sacred uh, obligation if we can recruit first generation students, make them successful. As I said in my uh, installation address, you sort of break the chain because most families, once you obtain a college degree, every succeeding generation follows suit and that family is now off on a different trajectory. So it's something we're extremely proud of. And I don't think, frankly, we always get enough credit for. Uh, yeah. It is, it is uh, really is something that I, is I read, I read in your statistics, I think this is an unusual number. Please tell me if I'm wrong. 98% of your undergraduates get financial aid. Is uh, that a, high? A little bit high, 95%. Uh, it's a commitment that we make to make a, what we believe, of course, is a first class private higher education degree as affordable as possible. It makes a big difference. It's the difference, we believe, between some students getting yeah. a college degree and not getting one. We should, we should mention you're a, a to totally tuition driven school. There are a lot of universities that get state money. A lot of universities get state money. A lot of universities have infinitely larger endowments than we do. Um, we're tuition and enrollment driven. You say some really remarkable things in your address, so I'm going to read for a few moments. I try not to do this. I was really captivated by your referring to uh, what you learned at the University of Scranton, a Jesuit school. And I can't even pronounce one of these words, <laughs> maybe both of them. It says, this is your address, I learned two things at Scranton that will always inform my thinking 
here at Wilkes. The first of these is Cura Personalis. That's right. And care, what is that? It's care for the whole person in their uniqueness. So it's the idea that as a uh, most effective higher education or educational institution of any kind, you really need to understand every individual student who shows up in a class or on a team or at a, in, in a, in a um, extracurricular activity, understand them well enough to understand where they, where they are and try to take them from that point to a, a higher level of development. It's why institutions like ours fight to keep class sizes uh, you know, small so that the, the magic that happens between faculty members and students can happen. And as those, as those class sizes grow, it's just not possible to, to do sort of, cure of personalis is a Jesuit term, so I'm yeah. gonna use what Wilkes uses, and that is mentoring. Sure. Uh, same concept, different term, uh, it's the same commitment to it at Wilkes as there is at, at Scranton. And here's the other one, Magis? Magis. Magis. This is great stuff. What's it mean? Uh, the restless pursuit of excellence motivated by gratitude. And it's the idea that um, constantly never satisfied, always pursuing excellence, but a lot of people pursue excellence. What makes it the Magis is what motivates that pursuit. It's not vanity, not prestige, not, you know, uh, uh, anything. It's, 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 I'm so grateful for the opportunities that we have that it motivates us to uh, deliver even more it's a for our way students. To go through life, being grateful. It's great. And, and it takes uh, us all the way. I'll have to come up with another term. Again, the Jesuits have those trademarked, I think. So I'll come up with another term. <laughs> Let's go to the audience. Would you introduce yourself? Uh, my name's Sam Miller. I'm a junior at Wilkes. And um, my question to you is, I actually sent you the email a while back. You probably remembered it was the uh, track and field I, I email. I do indeed, yeah. So I know you have a genuine interest in it, but how do you, because I've talked to numerous students about it. Like, I just asked random students, like, hey, would you be interested if books had track and field? But how come it hasn't had it to date? Like, it's just a really interesting thing, because the track and field tends to be a relatively large sport in numbers that it can create. Yes, so it, why doesn't it have it? Thank you for saying that, Sam. Um, we are... Uh, committed to uh, studying uh, the possibility of bringing track and field to Wilkes. Um, frankly, it's part of an overall strategy that we want to employ to use more athletic opportunities to not only attract students to Wilkes, but enrich their experience while they're there. Uh, student athletes at a Division III environment, which Sam's referring to, they outperform, generally speaking, they outperform their classmates. Uh, in the classroom, wow. they retain at higher rates, they graduate at higher rates. It would be, in my opinion, uh, uh, wise for us to grow the number of, of athletic opportunities at, at Wilkes. Track and field in particular, because as Sam points out, it is the single most popular sport in the U.S. at the high school level in terms of the number of participants. And you can have really large roster sizes, so you can offer that opportunity to a lot of different students, both male and female students. Uh, I'm just going to ask you to give me a little bit more time on that, uh, Sam. I, I've been in the that's, job that's six fine. months. That's fine. Uh, some of the others in the audience would tell you that we've we've talked a lot about this, and it is something that's top of mind. So, do you are you satisfied with that answer? It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good thing I remembered his email. Huh? I did remember. That's that's terrific. Um, I'm aware of some uh, successes and struggles that Wilkes has had, and I know you've done your homework. Let's talk about it just to get it kind of on the record. School of Pharmacy has been huge. What a tremendous growth decision that was for Wilkes. What's the history of that? Uh, as I understand it, it started in 1995, I believe, and uh, at the time, there was a shortage of pharmacy programs in the northeast part of the, of, uh, the country. I don't know the exact numbers, Bill, but uh, evidently we were early to that uh, mm -hmm. uh, market, if you will. We established, fortunately, an extremely uh, positive uh, reputation. But uh, word is catching on, and uh, the proliferation of pharmacy schools in mm -hmm. the northeast part of the U.S. Is, is tremendous. Despite that, I'm very proud that uh, I think in the northeast, you know, the board they need to take upon graduation 
I think uh, I heard that we have the second highest pass rate of any of the schools in the northeast part of the United States out of our pharmacy program. Isn't, so isn't you can it, tell a proud university well, president. Sure. Isn't um, it a shame you can't patent a great idea? Yes, exactly. <laughs> and keep others from uh, yes, opening exactly. up schools. I guess that's I, I <laughs> right. didn't realize that Very competition has increased, but that's inevitable. Right? It is, it but is. let's talk about the what was hoped would be a school of law. I know a lot of people had their heart and their shoulder at the wheel yes. to make that happen there. Yes, and again, before my time, but as I understand it, people ask me, is the law school concept uh, in the trash? And I say, well, no, it's on the shelf uh, and will remain on the shelf for a while, but it's not in the trash. I mean, we're the kind of university that's always going to be open to new possibilities. I think in retrospect, the decision not to pursue a law school was, uh, uh, was a great decision. I and mean, yeah. as you've heard, you know, there's been a, quite a fallout in law school education over Absolutely. the last number of years. To be a startup law school in the midst of that, I think would have been um, uh, too difficult a proposition. So it was a choice to sort of pursue the law school or to build our science facility. Yeah. I don't think anyone will uh, no. criticize that decision. Especially no. when they see the new facility. Here's somebody that almost everybody knows, Clayton Carambellis. <laughs> no, you can't take the microphone, Clayton. We know better. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not used to this. <laughs> Go ahead. What do you want to say? I want to make a comment because I was almost the father of Wilkes because I went to that school in 1945. And Dr. Farley was there, and he was a tremendous driving force with about three buildings, mm -hmm. and you could never get lost on campus. <laughs> and Dr. Farley always had you, had you in his sights. You must wear a tie when you go to school at Wilkes. Mm -hmm. And if you didn't, when he went to shake your hand and you didn't have the tie, he twisted it. Mm. So that was just a, a little joke well, that we had. I bet these students are happy that's not the case today. <laughs> I know. But I'm so delighted to see the progression because I was with all of the presidents as they came to the school. And, you know, to con constantly try to top, yeah. it's almost impossible. And here we have the youngest president with a family, delightful children, and a very attractive and uh, vivacious young lady for his wife. Careful. We <laughs> I get, in, I get in trouble here. <laughs> no, seriously, I just wanted to express the, uh, my thoughts and the other people that I've talked to. How <clears throat> delighted we are to have you aboard, yeah. and we know Wilkes is going to continue on its climb. Well, Clayton, if Thank you, you will be sure. No, don't let him. Julie. Don't let him go. Would you get Clayton back? You don't get away that easily, Clayton. We, we know Clayton well. Um, and you've been a wonderful benefactor of, of Wilkes for a long time. But if I've read my notes correctly, and I never made the connection before right now, World War II, um, Wilkes survives, it's said, because of the GI Bill. It struggled very much because all the, all the, most of the men and a lot of people went away. And so, the tuition, it wasn't there. Then the GI Bill happens. And my notes make reference to flyboys. Now, I know that you were a pilot. I was. Uh, I, I did go in the service, and we were supposed to go to flying schools, but at that time, the war was coming to an end, and they didn't need all the pilots. So when I got out, I learned how to fly, and consequently, I did a lot of different things with it. But if I help me with this, because you talk about it in your in your address, yes. was it the President Farley who went to Washington yeah, to help I, keep the university lights on? As I understand it, uh, then President Farley went to Washington looking for a way that uh, Bucknell University Junior College, still at that time, could help serve the war effort, and so they sent the Army uh, Air Corps sent cadets up to Wilkesbury to uh, to be trained. And that gave us a steady stream of students during that really tough time. Uh, I joke that uh, while this generation was saving the world from tyranny, they also saved the University. Bucknell University <laughs> Junior College along the way. So uh, fascinating.
So you weren't one of those flyboys. I wa wasn't one of those because I went in before that got established. Yeah. And, uh, of course, I ended up flying anyhow after yeah. I got out. So. Can, I, can I just say about Please. Clayton, um, he's not only a friend of Wilkes University, he's one of our best friends. Uh, I had the great privilege of um, uh, presenting him with an award uh, that the chamber gave to him. And um, I, I joked that I kept seeing this man all around town. Oh, and I, yeah. I thought that maybe he must be the mayor of Wilkes-Barre. <laughs> and then I saw, and then I met Tom Layton, and then I saw him all around the Westmoreland Club. And I said, well, he must be the GM of the Westmoreland Club. And no, then I met the GM. Then I started seeing him all around campus. Imagine how nervous I was, <laughs> <laughs> wondering if maybe he was the president of Wilkes. But uh, I, then I come to find out he's uh, one of our most dis distinguished alums and well, our closest friends. I, so can thank you the, you, I can give you the perfect comeback. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, Clayton, we only have an hour, so you have to sit down. <laughs> but I, I have, there's a comeback for you. You were talking about Dr. Leahy's wife being vivacious and so on, and I said, be careful. Yours is also very vivacious. Yes. 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 <laughs> thank you. Thank you. All right, we, we don't have a lot of time left in this interview. You'd be amazed how fast an yes. hour goes by. We have about 10 minutes left in what must seem like 15. Um, so let me cover the really moving things that were in your inaugural address and some of the really poignant, powerful statements of challenge that lie ahead. You're a successor. Your predecessor probably didn't face this bundle New presidents face a different bundle of challenges. And here are a few of them. I, I was really caught by, uh, caught by this. The number of traditional college-aid students in the Northeast, our primary recruiting market, is declining by some estimates as much as 11% over the next decade. In the Northeast, which you say is easily the most competitive higher education market in the country. E easily, in my opinion, the most competitive. If you look at the number of schools that populate the Northeast, as well as the quality of those schools. I mean, think about it. The first schools that were founded in the U.S., of course, were founded here in the, in the Northeast. And they had, in some cases, a 100-year head start on us. And so they're very high quality, very well endowed. And uh, it's, uh, th th there's probably in the future going to be too much capacity for the number of students. Well, then you talk about Harvard. This is powerful. Your words, when Harvard University, by most accounts the leading university in the world, begins to offer courses online to anyone in the world at no charge, what does this mean for the rest of us? What does it mean for the rest of us? <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm still trying to figure that out, to be honest with you. Um, I think, you know, it's, it is a clarion call to those of us in higher education when Harvard elects to do something like that. Now, they're not offering degrees, of course, online to everyone, uh, but it does send a, a signal that uh, things are changing in education, and I think it forces us to redouble our efforts to build value in what we do offer. Um, I don't believe that online education, however it grows, and it is growing, will ever replace the experience at um, a residential undergraduate institution. I say often, it's, we're not just about information, we're about formation. Mm -hmm. And you can't, to my knowledge, have that formative experience online the way you can uh, in a residential college. So we're not looking to that day in the distant future when you won't need residence halls anymore. Well, I also say in there, strangely enough, that there are some students, maybe some here tonight, that live in our residence halls and eat in our dining halls, and if given the option, might take an online course over a traditional course. Now, that says something about this generation of students that we're... Okay. Let's talk uh, to, to that generation to, uh, of students. Would you educate. introduce yourself? You are a student, right? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, good evening, Dr. Leahy. Uh, Ian Foley. I'm Ian Foley. I'm a junior uh, political science and communication uh, studies Are you major. one of the students he was just talking about? You'd rather be online? Um, I think both ways are fantastic. It's important to have that hands-on learning and to 
meet with the professors and uh, get that mentoring he was talking about with them. Otherwise, if you don't know your professors, you don't have that opportunity. With Wilkes, it's great because I can get to know my communication and political science professors well, and they can connect me with internship opportunities, and it's great to get advice on them, how to work on the job and how to impress my internship supervisor. Wow. Did you script him? No. <laughs> I'm it's just indicative of the quality of the I Wilkes guess. students. <laughs> yeah. so what's your question? I was wondering, of all the fields you could go into, why higher education? Well, yeah. Are you setting me up? Ian? That is, I have a question here just like that. Uh, Thank you. We didn't even talk beforehand. I'll, I'll give you the line I always use. Um, I believe higher education is the world's most compelling work. And people often ask me, that's a bold statement uh, given, of course, you know, medical fields that save people's lives and the legal field that rights wrongs and you know, the business uh, field that builds wealth for individuals. But uh, my uh, rationale behind that statement is that higher education, we have the opportunity to educate all of the professionals that populate those fields. And that's an incredible opportunity, and I find it uh, the world's most compelling work. Okay, fair enough. Thank you very much. Now we get to talk about being an English major. I enjoyed this a lot. I'm an English major, oh, great. but I'm fascinated by your, your, your background educationally um, and where to begin. But I loved in your, in your inaugural address how you quote, did a lot of quoting of great literary figures in history. <clears throat> but you also talk about how um, proud you are of Wilkes' essential liberal arts nature. And you, you say, uh, among other things, that we, we're a place where engineers read Shakespeare. That's right. The, the thinking is we want our engineers, of course, upon graduation to be first-class technical engineers. But we have greater ambition for our graduates than just that. We want them to become leaders in their fields, lead other engineers, collaborate with other uh, professionals across other uh, fields. And in order to do that, you need to develop, in my opinion, um, the kind of characteristics that come with the liberal arts, and in particular, by reading Shakespeare. So um, the joke, it, that came up at a meeting with faculty, and it was an a, a impromptu remark on my, on my behalf that I think engineers ought to read Shakespeare, and it's become sort of our model for, um, despite the professional uh, education that we offer, we still believe strongly in a core general education humanities and liberal arts uh, component to our Wilkes degree. I can remember forever ago when I went to college that my best professors used to say, the reason you're here is to learn how to think critically. And that always made an impression on me. But that's the essence of liberal arts thinking, isn't it? Uh, I think it is. I mean, how to, how to uh, think critically, how to uh, articulate your opinions and defend them. Yeah. Uh, how to be uh, imaginative and creative. I mean, these are all characteristics that as one moves on in their career become increasingly important. So I think part of it for those of us who believe in the liberal arts, even as majors, I think we need to continue to make the case that an English degree, I mean, two gainfully employed ones right here. <laughs> Last time I checked. Uh, you know, English degree, a history degree, you know, a science degree, I mean, th those degrees are going to pay off over the long haul if we can just get confident enough to, to, to major in those fields. In of course, the, arts. the concern is, you know, yeah. what's my first job out? Exactly. And that's a what legitimate concern. It? But I think well, I want to continue to make the case that the training that the humanities and liberal arts offers uh, is something that pays off over time. I heard recently someone said, we're not just about job placement, mm -hmm. we're about career promise. And if you think of the long haul, I think the liberal arts uh, serve that, the long haul in a, in a really effective way. I think we have another student uh, standing up. Sir, would you identify yourself? <laughs> <laughs> Here's one of our engineers that reads Shakespeare. Um, yes, and I remember our conversation about Shakespeare and engineering. Would you tell us who you are? I'm Bob Taylor, director of the engineering management program. Do sir. you read Shakespeare? 
Pardon? Do you read Shakespeare? I did. You did? <laughs> <laughs> because my English professor made me do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, a little humor, perhaps, but you've been with us for seven, nearly seven months and seen the engineering uh, and getting used to our left brain waves. Um, do, you, do you still think that uh, we're a strong part of, of the Wilkes community and, and, uh, and how you see us going forward? The engineering, yes. Harry in particular, Bob? <laughs> I would say not only an important part of it, an essential part of it. One of the things that uh, I'm, I'm most proud of at Wilkes is that we have a program mix that is the envy of most institutions our size. In fact, it's a program mix that, in my opinion, is a lot more like a research university. Engineering, a critical part of that, the only engineering program in the entire northeast part of the state of Pennsylvania. But w with that program mix, we still offer that program mix in, in a small, uh, caring, mentoring environment, more like a liberal arts college. So you take the program mix of a research institution and the culture of a small liberal arts college, that combination is important, is unique, and uh, engineering is a critical part of that. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. All right, back to Cura Personalis, which you learned at the University of Scranton, Jesuit education, but you said at Wilkes we call it mentoring. That's right. I'm going to share a little personal thing with you that refers to um, your inaugural address. My mentor, when I first stepped up to the plate to get this job, gave me the same quote you gave hmm. in your address, Daniel Hudson Burnham, the preeminent American architect at the turn of the 20th century said, and I quote, make no small plans. Make no little plans, for they have no power to stir the soul. I've been able to identify that for, with that for a long time. Evidently, you have too. Absolutely. Um, little, little small thinking doesn't stir the soul. Uh, big thinking does. And I say in there that uh, my plan, just to follow up on the, the comment I just made, is to make uh, Wilkes University one of the top small universities, not just in this area, but in the country. Now, if I said we want to be one of the best universities in the country, there'd be a lot of universities that would have something to say about that, right? But to say small university, our size with that program mix, that's a much smaller group of universities around the country that have that mix of those institutions, I think we can be one of the best, in the, uh, the best of those institutions. That's not a, that's a bold statement, but I think it's worth But you want pursuing. to be bold, don't you? Yeah. yeah. All right, so in the couple of minutes we have remaining, let's get personal. Um, you've been here seven years? I've been here. Yeah, in Northeastern nine. Pennsylvania. Nine. This is my ninth nine year. Nine years. Yeah. Came from uh, the land of Cornell University right. and Ithaca and Cayuga Lake and Buttermilk Falls. That's right. That's right. Re beautiful place. You've been here. What is it? that you have learned in your short, by comparison with everybody else, your short duration in Northeast Pennsylvania that makes it special for you? Uh, I love the uh, values of the people uh, here in Northeastern Pennsylvania. Um, when I uh, came to the area eight or nine years ago uh, and met a lot of the individuals, I just got a sense that this is a, would be a fantastic place to raise my family. Uh, and my family's obviously incredibly important to me, and I would move to a place where I thought they would grow up um, in, a, in the right environment. And uh, it's the values of the people here, uh, the work ethic, the, the, the family centeredness. Um, that's what attracts me to the area, um, and that's what will, I, I hope, keep us here for a long time. Well, I think we all do too. Uh, what a wonderful audience. Thank you all for being here. Let me shake your hand, Dr. Leahy. Thank you. Good luck to you. My pleasure. Thank you, Thanks, Thank you. Thank you.